Hey everyone, this is Nick and the last release of KDE Plasma is now out, at least for the KDE 5 series. The next one will be Plasma 6 and the KDE team definitely wants Plasma 5 to end with a bang. They fixed multi-monitor support, added tiling, improved virtually all Plasma widgets, polished everything, completed Wayland support with fractional scaling and global shortcuts, and they still found the time to make Discover actually useful. So I poured over the change logs and the weekly blog posts, and I gathered here all the major and minor features that you can expect, and there is a lot to cover, including this segue to today's sponsor. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is my favorite solution to run a Linux or gaming server. It's what I use to run my own Nextcloud instance and my own only office server. The interface is super easy to use. They are affordable, they have tons of documentation online, and they have one-click deployable servers for a ton of applications or games, like Pi-hole. Pi-hole is a DNS sinkhole that filters out requests to add serving domains. Basically, it lets you block ads and improve network performance. It lets you actively monitor every DNS request made on your network and block requests as they come in. And you can deploy it in one click on Linode so you can ensure I stay poor. And to get you started, Linode is giving you $100 of free credit to get your own Linux server or gaming server running. To get access to that, just click the link in the description below. And let's begin with Plasma Welcome, their whole new first run experience to let new users get to grips with Plasma. This new little app will open after a fresh KDE install, at least if your distro decides to use it. By default, it's nine pages, but you can skip it altogether. It explains the very basics, like how to connect to the internet or how to change settings, but it also presents a bunch of great features Plasma has and never really talked about before. These include vaults, the encrypted folders, activities, KDE Connect, KRunner, the system overview, and the ability to get new themes, wallpapers, widgets, and more. And it is excellent. It's a very nice introduction to let people know about features that were never that well explained and it really showcases the power of KDE. It's a great step to fix the discoverability issue that KDE has, and which I made a video about with a very clickbaity thumbnail. KDE has tons of power, but it might as well not exist. It's completely wasted if users don't know about it. Now you also get the mandatory App Store page listing various applications you can get, and you get a telemetry data page that lets you enable data collection if you want which also means that this data collection slider has been removed from the settings homepage, since users have already been exposed to that choice. Finally, you get the online accounts page and how to get involved or how to support KDE financially. Distributions will apparently be able to customize these pages at startup, so it might be interesting to see what distros decide to push what, but it's also sure to annoy KD veterans because now it adds one more click at every install. Oh no, KD is bloated now. Okay, but you're here for the mainline feature, right? The tiling capabilities of KD. So let's talk about that. While KWIN won't replace a full tiling window manager, it now has the ability to create tiling layouts and then to place windows in the various tiles you created. To set up a tiling layout, you press super plus T and you'll get that overview with a default layout in three columns. You have the ability to load another layout from a pre-made selection, and you can also adjust the padding between zones, which will be reflected when tiling windows. Each zone can be split into others, either horizontally or vertically, or removed entirely. And then, once your layout suits you, all you have to do is drag a window while holding shift, and your window will automatically occupy the tiling zone it's sitting above. Tiling zones are either static or floating, meaning you can keep a portion of your screen with floating windows if you want. Windows when tiled can be resized and the tiling layout will also reflect these changes. It's a very cool new addition, but since I'm a nitpicky bastard, I have some complaints. First, it's impossible to discover by yourself. The shortcut is never explained unless you go look for it in the desktop effect called Tiling Editor and nowhere does it tell you that you need to press shift to place windows in this mode either, so discoverability is basically non-existent. Second, you cannot save your own layouts. 
If you craft one you like, but decide to quickly move to another one for a specific temporary setup, there's no way to go back to the previous one. It's just lost and you'll have to create it again. Third, there are no keyboard shortcuts to place windows in the tiling zones. You have to do it with the mouse and the shift key, which is sure to annoy people who are used to a regular tiling manager and want to use a mouse as little as possible. Although maybe there are shortcuts and I just could not find them, but I looked everywhere, I swear. Anyway, the implementation of auto-tiling in Pop! OS should probably have been the example to follow here. It's fluid, it's easy to understand, and it can be toggled on or off easily and graphically. Still, it's a cool addition and I'm sure a lot of people will find it useful. I just hope that they refine it in Plasma 6. Okay, but the meat of the changes are in the Plasma desktop. The widgets and tools have received so many improvements that even in this lengthy section, I cannot list them all. First, KRunner got a nice update to surface more relevant search results. It can now search in any part of a file's name and will offer a web search when no results are available. It also displays time zones in a much more legible manner and you can search for specific time zones, like for example time CET, and it will show you how far ahead or behind they are compared to your current time zone. Settings pages are also now placed higher in the results when you search for their exact name. And so are files. If you type their exact name, they'll appear first, unless they're really old and there's something else that shares the exact same name and that feels more relevant. And if you search for a dictionary definition, pressing enter will copy it to the clipboard with a notification to let you know it happened. KRunner is wonderful and it's great to see them still working on its logic, but I don't know if that search logic is also applied to the kickoff menu or not. Then, as a general change, when hovering over widgets, they will tell you what you can expect if you middle-click them. For example, turning airplane mode when middle-clicking the network applet. The tooltips have also been greatly improved, with the one for Bluetooth showing battery life for connected devices. The one for D&D... No, not Dungeons & Dragons, do not disturb. So, the one for do not disturb is now showing you when the mode ends, and basically all tooltips have more information. The calendar widget now also supports more calendars, including the Hebrew calendar. The battery monitor now shows the charging status of connected devices. The media applet now has two layouts, one for horizontal panels with the album art and the song title, and one for vertical panels with the album art only. The color picker can now show up to nine colors instead of just one, and clicking a color will automatically copy it to the clipboard with a notification. The weather widget can now display the temperature in the taskbar and has an easier to use location picker. Folder view now lets you show hidden folders if you want, pop-up notes will make links clickable by default when you paste them into a note, and kickoff now supports separators in the menu if you added them in the menu editor, without borking your keyboard navigation as they are not selected when using the keyboard. Oh, but that's not all. Yeah, they really went into overdrive for this release. In no particular order, the wallpaper list should be much faster since it now uses multiple CPU cores to render them. Changing wallpapers now uses a transition animation, just like changing themes will do now. Floating panels will automatically be defloated when a window touches them and they will use less padding and less space in that defloated mode. The breeze theme now has an outline around windows in dark mode, which makes them more easy to parse at a glance. Trying to use a VPN will prompt you to install the relevant plugin that supports it. The screenshot tool now remembers the last used rectangular selection until you close the app, and it now lets you change the screenshot type straight from the sidebar. And then there's the Wayland support. Plasma now supports high-resolution scrolling under Wayland for smoother mouse operations, and they now support content types, which lets the compositor adjust the display's refresh rates depending on what you're doing, watching a movie, playing a game, or web browsing. Of course, you will need to have a display that supports variable refresh rates. Fractional scaling is also now natively supported under Wayland. You could do it before, but it was a hack. It rendered at the closest integer scale, so 1x or 2x, and then scaled down from this to reach your desired scaling factor. Now, it renders directly at the factor you want, for example 1.25, and this results in less battery consumption, more performance, and less blurriness. When sharing your screen on Wayland, the window picker will now have thumbnails to let you decide what you want to share. And there's also a new setting to let X Wayland applications access the key presses of the whole system, 
so they get global shortcuts back. And using the open file with app action from the context menu, we'll now open the relevant portal, so everything looks nicer and is more secure. Oh, and here comes another major change, the multi-monitor refactoring. Plasma was infamous for the various issues it created with multi-monitor setups, especially if you frequently unplugged external monitors and replugged them. Well, this should be over now. Plasma revamped their whole way of handling this, so all panels, windows, wallpapers and widgets are saved per monitor and restored when a monitor is plugged back in. These monitor sets are kept between X11 and Wayland, and the UI was revamped when using three monitors or more, letting you attribute monitor numbers to every one of them and place them better. The display applet will also auto-hide now in the icon tray when you only have one monitor or when you're using a desktop setup with multiple displays. But on a laptop with an external monitor or more, it will stay visible at all times and you can click it to surface some options easily. I'm not saying that all bugs related to multi-monitors have been fixed, but you should definitely have a much more pleasant experience now. And also, where would KDE be without more settings? So yeah, let's look at that. First are Flatpak permissions. They have their own new settings page that lets you review what applications have access to and give them more permissions or remove some. It's not quite as complete as what Flatseal offers, but it's pretty damn close. You also get some general changes like the highlight change settings button that moved to the hamburger menu and that now will show you the keyboard shortcuts you changed. Some settings pages like the desktop session settings now use a more legible look with bold headers that let you parse the page more easily. It should make its way to other pages in the future. On top of that, the icon size preferences in the appearance settings have been redesigned. The launch feedback settings don't have their own page anymore, they've been moved to the cursors page, which makes much more sense. The info center will now show you OpenCL related informations. The keyboard shortcuts page now has a new custom commands UI, which should be way easier to use than the previous one, and it lets you pick a script file with a graphical file picker. There's also a new touchscreen page and the drawing tablet page now lets you map your pen buttons to specific commands, but since I don't own any of these devices, I can't really show you how that looks. And there's also some progress on Discover. It will now show more Flatpak permissions on applications pages, including Bluetooth access, for example, and it won't show the category of an app in its card in the results since it's just not that useful of an information. The homepage has received a new look with editor's choice, popular applications and categories, so it's easier to navigate. The all applications button is also now back in the sidebar because navigating without it was kind of a pain. And when you're searching for something inside of a category, if nothing is available, you'll get a nice message and a button to search the whole store and not just that specific category. On top of that, offline updates will now give you more information on the packages you're updating and there's a message when you're in offline mode instead of a never-ending progress bar. So yeah, basically now Discover lives up to its name. It actually lets you discover applications. Nice. And I'm still missing all the bug fixes and some other minor changes to applets, widgets and whatever else on the desktop. The next version will be Plasma 6 and we might have to wait more than 4 months to get it. So in the meantime, every KDE user will be stuck on 5.27. So it's really good that it's so good. It's insanely polished compared to a few releases ago. It's faster, its Wayland support is basically complete with fractional scaling, global shortcuts and portals. And multi-monitor support is now finally excellent and should result in way less issues especially on laptops. It's a wonderful version and you should absolutely install it if your distro offers it. It's a very solid foundation for us to wait on while the team works on Plasma 6. Heavily recommended. Like today's sponsor. If you're in the market for a new computer and you plan to run Linux on it, stop looking at Windows devices and crossing your fingers and praying that everything will run smoothly on Linux. Buy something that supports Linux out of the box from today's sponsor, Tuxedo. They are based in Germany, but they ship worldwide and they have a nice big range of devices that should cover every price point and every need, whether it's an affordable Ultrabook or a super high-end workstation tower or a gaming laptop, they have it. They're all very customizable with plenty of options to tailor your device to what you want to do with it 
and they're all repairable, upgradable, you can have your own custom keyboard layout laser etched on the keys of your laptop, your own custom logo laser etched on the lid of your laptop, or no logo at all if you don't like branding. So if you need a new computer and you want to run Linux on it, and you want to help support Linux's development, buy a new computer from Tuxedo using the link in the description below. They are really cool. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like it, well, there's always that dislike button and the comment section to let me know what I messed up. And if you really enjoy the channel and you want to support what I do, there are plenty of links down there in the description for PayPal, Super Thanks, YouTube memberships, Patreon memberships. Those last two give you access to specific benefits. Check them out if you're interested. In the meantime, thank you all for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!